Well, hello and welcome back to Ancient Ways for Modern Days. Mike Freeman here from Valley Christian Fellowship. So excited to have you join us as we continue to take a devotional look chapter by chapter of the New Testament. Now, I just want to remind you, this follows the Valley Christian Fellowship Bible Reading Plan. And if you don't have that, you can access that on our website through Faith Life. Uh, you can Google us. You can email me. Um, would love to get you connected with the, a reading plan. And uh, if you're behind, that's okay. I tell people, you know what? Falling behind happens. If you fall behind, just jump right back in from today's date and, uh, and don't don't worry about trying to catch up. Don't worry about trying to make sure you get it all in. I would rather have you faithfully read starting from this point forward than to feel the, the kind of overwhelming like, I got to get all of this done. So that said, make sure you're reading the Bible. Make sure you're following along. And uh, thanks for joining us as we continue to walk through the book of Matthew. Today we are in Matthew 23, which is a, let's just put it out there, it is an intense chapter of the Bible. Jesus, he he is uh, in full confrontation mode with, with the Pharisees. He's not subtle about it anymore. He is, uh, He's accusatory toward them. And he lays it out there just based on how they live and how they act. And so why don't you go ahead and join me, open up to Matthew chapter 23, and what we're going to do is we're going to pick up in verses 2 and 3, and I'm actually going to cover kind of the whole chapter in in sweeping fashion. I want to cover the whole thing so that we can kind of get a sense of the, the feel for the whole chapter, and I want us to remember that this is, the book of Matthew is Matthew's goal is to show us that Jesus is the true king of the Jews. He is the long-awaited Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, and he is a great king. He is the best king. He is a he is the spiritual leader. He is the the national leader. He is the ultimately the global and cosmic leader that we should want and desire. And we see that in particular in this chapter with the contrast of the the um, the wickedness of the religious leaders of Jesus's day. And so let's uh, let's follow along. Why don't you follow along with me? Matthew 23, let's jump in. Uh, verses two and three, it says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. Now, this is these are Jesus' words here. This is Jesus describing the scribes and the Pharisees. And he says, they sit in Moses' seat. And this is a kind of a, almost like an official position where, where the religious leaders would sit and they would teach the people of God and they would teach them the word of God. And so really, this is in essence Jesus saying, when they're teaching from the word of God, you should listen to them because it's the word of God. They're they're actually teaching the scripture, and so you want to listen to what they're teaching. But don't listen to what they live. Follow what they teach from the scripture, but when you watch their lives, don't live like them. Why? He tells us, because they do not practice what they preach. You've heard that phrase before, practice what you preach. What they teach from the scripture, they do not even even come close to living according to it. Why? Because they're, they see their religious life as a life of gain for themselves. Let me show you what I mean. Let's keep going. Verses four through seven, Jesus describes these religious leaders. Look at how he describes them. He says, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others for they make their phylacteries broad on their and their fringes long and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. Let's stop there for a second. He, Jesus is basically, he's describing their spiritual abuse. He says that they are, they're more than eager to, to load the people up with all sorts of burdens. They're, they're willing to tell people, here's how you need to live, but they're not willing to help people live that way. They'll heap on the guilt and the condemnation people have because of their unrighteousness, but they don't show them the way to, to life. They don't show them the grace of God. They're not willing to help people. Why? Well, because 
It's because they're really all about themselves. It describes them being all about themselves in a few different ways. It says that they, they want the attention of people, right? That they want the attention. They want their deeds to be seen by others. They, they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They, their, their garments and, and their attire is attractive and it marks them as spiritual people. And so look at, look at me, look at me, look at me. They, they're garnering all of the attention. It says they, they love the place of honor at feasts. They love the best seat in the synagogue. When they walk through the market, they love the the attention they get and the respect they get from everyone that's around them. Why? Because because their spiritual life is really all about them. Their, Their spiritual life is about them and what they look like and the attention they receive and the benefits that come with being a, 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 a man of God. And Jesus is criticizing. He's going to criticize them even more. Let's keep going a little bit further though. Verses 8 through 12. It says, But you are not to be called rabbi. You are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Okay, Jesus here, he's He's, he's making some things really clear to them. And, and the context, we, we have to interpret this based on the context. The context is the sinful pride of these religious leaders. These religious leaders in their sinful pride means that they are, they are all about their title and their authority and their image. They're all about themselves. And so the point here is that titles and authority is not the point. <laughs> That's really the point. They have made the spiritual life all about themselves and their titles and their authority. And Jesus said, that, that's not the point. Chasing titles and authority rather than chasing Christ and truth is ungodly. It's, it's wicked. Trying to get a position so you can be seen as better than other people, it is, it is wicked. Now, when Jesus says no one should be called a teacher, does this mean we, we shouldn't call anyone a teacher? When he says no one should be called father, does this mean we should not call our father's father? I, I really don't think that's the point he's making here. Other places in the scripture, we're, we're told about teachers and, and we're given instruction and especially in like spiritual gifts, there, there's even the spiritual gift of sheep, of teacher and shepherd and, and there are elders, right? And so in that, his point is not don't ever call anyone anything besides their name. His point is we should not be chasing these spiritual <laughs> positions as a means to lord it over other people. Um, and, and likewise, allowing any, any teacher to be more respected or more trusted or more, more obeyed than God is it's not what we're supposed to do. And so do you have teachers? Yeah, I hope you have great teachers. Do you have a pastor that you call pastor? That's fine. If, if he demands you call him pastor, I think that's where you start getting kind of in, in weird ground. But, but the point here is, do they have more authority? Do they have more influence than God or the word of God? Now then, the, the, the text transitions, and I want to transition over back to it because now Jesus begins to talk about the seven woes. And I'm just going to briefly walk through these. But let's look at these seven woes. The fo- first woe is... They're a barrier. Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And then he describes seven different ways that um, he's condemning them. And so he talks about how they're a barrier to others coming to faith. And then he talks about how they disciple others away from God. They don't train people to follow God. They actually train people away from God. He talks about how he says, woe to you because they're blind guides. And then they neglect the greater things. They neglect justice and mercy, and faithfulness. So woe to them. Not only that, he says, woe to them. They're, they're full of greed and self-indulgence. He uses the imagery of a, uh, of a cup that's washed on the outside, but not on the inside. Because on the inside, they're full of greed and self-indulgence. And then uh, he continues, he says, they're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so this is the idea that uh, of a whitewashed tomb. He says, the tomb on the outside, it's white and it's clean. He says, but woe to you because inside you're dead because of your hypocrisy and your lawlessness. And then finally, he describes them as those who stand in line with everyone who has opposed God's anointed people, the prophets, the servants of God. And ultimately, they, they oppose Christ himself. 
But here's where I want us to land. I want us to land it in one final part of this chapter, toward the very end, verse 37. Listen to what Jesus, listen to how this kind of starts to come to an end. After he's listed out these woes to all these leaders because of their failure to be godly shepherds, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. And you are not willing. See, Jesus is... His point in all this is is the religious leaders and the people, he wants so desperately to draw them to himself, to, to be their shepherd, but they're unwilling. The religious leaders are so full of pride, they're unwilling to be drawn to, to Jesus. The crowds we're going to see not far from now, they're going to be crying out for Jesus' crucifixion. Why? Because, because they stone their prophets and kill those who God sends. They're unwilling They're unwilling to be drawn near. Their pride, their pride has prevented that. Here's where I want us to land today. I'm not trying to call anyone a Pharisee. I'm not trying to call you a brood of vipers. uh, My goal is not to call you a whitewashed tomb or a cup that's clean on the outside but dirty on the inside. But but here's the ancient way for our modern day right now. The, the, The point of all this is to say, are you willing to be gathered to Jesus? Are you willing to lay aside your pride? Maybe you're a leader in your church. Maybe you're a Bible answer man in, in your realm of influence. Maybe you got all the answers, but, but inside you're growing prideful and arrogant. You're not willing to be like a, a young chick being gathered to the, the mother hen. You're unwilling to be humble and come to Jesus and recognize your need for him. Today is just a just really this contrast, this contrast of of maybe us and how sometimes we get prideful, but but ultimately it's also a contrast of Jesus and the religious leaders. Jesus here, he is the true king. He is the good king. He is the best king. He is the leader that the people need. He is the leader we need. He's a leader we need to be pointing others toward. That's really the ancient way. Once again, the ancient way it's really Christ. The Christ is the best king we could ever have. I hope you're encouraged as you reflect on this. I hope you think deeply about your own heart. And I really hope you you come back tomorrow as we continue to walk through the New Testament together.